Everyone has a dream. The one thing they want to mark off their to-do list before they check out. For these two cycling enthusiasts, that dream is to ride the mountains of the Tour de France. That dream is about to become a reality. An opportunity to hang with the team at this year's Tour de France is in their sights. But before they can cash in on the cyclist's dream, they must first survive the nightmare of riding the Tour de France's most punishing stage. It's getting a little bit scary now. Gonna be sick. Stage 16 of the Tour de France, arguably the hardest day of the three week event. In a few hours, the mountain stage will be flooded with team riders, staff, and race officials. Joe Prano and Adam Austin are not professional cyclists, and yet they're setting out to climb more than 80 miles of mountainous hell. Three months ago, this probably sounded like a good idea. Just 12 weeks before the biggest event on two wheels, the Discovery Channel issued a challenge to the amateur cycling community. Do you have what it takes to ride the Tour de France's toughest stage? The second he learned of the opportunity, 23-year-old cycling enthusiast Joe Prano accepted Discovery's challenge. Cycling, I, I just think it's, it's a test of human endurance. No sport that I've ever played is like cycling. It's the toughest sport I've ever done. Before signing up for the Discovery Channel's ride of a lifetime, Joe averaged around 15 miles a day on his bike. His stage 16 ride of the Tour de France is 77 miles in the high altitudes of the Pyrenees Mountains. Endurance training is a must, so Joe turns to the man who first introduced him to cycling, his Uncle Mike. Are right, you guys ready to do it? Let's this? do it. Let's All go. Right, good. Definitely, I was always on the bike. He always saw that. And, um, you know, it got to a point where he really had more and more interest, and he questioned me more and more. Who's going to take the lead on the first climb? I think it might have to be you. My Uncle Mike has definitely been an inspiration for, for cycling. Um, kind of. I planted the seed in my head and, and really showed me the ropes. Have you done the time trial yet this year, Joe? I'm going to do it uh, this weekend. You know, I love riding at home, particularly. I mean, just starting off here, you're going down a beautiful road. Um, you even go through some farmland. It's just, uh, the landscape is awesome. It kind of it inspires you to ride faster because you just uh, you want to see more of it. For many, the obsession for cycling begins at the time they learn to ride a bike. But for Adam Austin, the passion is still a new, developing one. When I first started riding and watching cycling on TV, I really got into the Discovery Team, obviously, with Lance Armstrong. and. Um, I, I mean, I know every single person on that team and um, all of their strengths and really follow them. At six foot one and 235 pounds, Adam is considerably larger than the average cyclist. I definitely don't have like the cyclist frame, but that's part of the challenge for me is, you know, why can't I do it? Three times a week, Adam makes a 12-mile ride across the flat roads of the nation's capital. His Tour de France climb will require him to ride further in one day than he is currently riding in a week. The Pyrenees and the Alps, I mean, that's like the apex of cycling. I'm out here climbing anthills. Being a novice and just really getting into this sport was really hard because I, I've had problems early on with asking people for help, and I don't like reading instructions. So those are probably the two things that uh, certainly didn't help me when I got involved in this sport. I was buying like a mountain bike helmet when I was riding my road bike. And so those things I really had to figure out on my own. I try to simulate as much race conditions as I can, you know? I know it's just my ride into work, but um, I really take it serious. I'm very deliberate because it's the part of the day that I have the most control over, and um, 
probably the part of the day that I enjoy the most. In less than two months, Joe and Adam's dream of riding a stage of the Tour de France becomes a reality. Before they leave, Discovery Channel will equip them with every tool necessary to help them accomplish their dream. Though Joe and Adam don't know it yet, Trek Bikes will offer them a key tool for their Tour de France ride and an inside look at one of their most confidential industry secrets. I'm Derek Doyle. I'm Adam. Adam, good Adam to meet Austin. you. Yeah. How are you, Joe Prano? Joe, great to meet you. Nice to meet you. Glad to have you on here. Aside from the Trek employees themselves, nice. very few people have entered into the actual carbon lab where the bikes are constructed. Here we have a couple uh, team frames that we're going to be sending to the Discovery team. And uh, the frames are the same ones that we make for the consumers. As you can see, this is our new Madone. Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah, it's like a fraction of that, uh, that plastic frame. Yeah. Because the Madone has not yet been released to the public, Trek takes every precaution in keeping the production process of this new revolutionary bike under wraps. Only after signing a confidentiality agreement can Joe and Adam enter this highly restricted area. Carbon fiber comes on large rolls, so they get from that to the frame. It's crazy. Carbon fiber allows Trek to produce one of the lightest bikes ever created. Here's the preform as it's cut out. The Madone frame weighs in at just 2.3 pounds. She's taking an aerospace epoxy adhesive, applying it to all the joints, and the material's ultra lightweight is only rivaled by its durability. Molded carbon, when designed correctly, is even stronger than steel. Even in these late stages of fabrication, weight remains a primary focus for the bike's production. Everything from the paint to the decals are created from lightweight substances to keep the Madone as light as possible. Hi, guys. I'm Tyler Pilger. Tyler, I'm, I'm Adam. Bike product manager. Joe Prano, nice to meet you. Joe, nice to meet you. Uh, we're going to talk about our new Madone. All of our new, uh, what we call our fuselage, our fork, our frame, and our seat mass system are about a half a pound lighter than the previous versions, which is really in a road bike. To, to lose a half pound these days is pretty yeah. incredible. If you look at the bike behind you, that's the new Madone 5.2. Can I take one home? Well, that's probably a good question. <laughs> What if, what if this was your bike? If that was my bike. Oh, man. Well, they are your bikes. <laughs> what? Yes? <laughs> are you kidding? Oh, man. Oh, Seriously? that is incredible. Oh, wow. Look at this thing. See how light it is? Yeah, it's like, yeah, I mean, it's I can hold it like in my finger and it just... That sounds about right. You guys are the first to have production bikes. The dealers will ride them for the first time a week from tomorrow. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thanks, thank no, you. thank uh, you. This will help go a little bit faster up the mountains, huh? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Few have ever seen the inner workings of the Trek facilities like this. <laughs> With the all-new Madones now in their possession, Joe and Adam have less than two months before their Tour de France ride. Both riders know that their training regimen cannot be limited to physical workouts. Mental preparations are just as important, if not more so. As Joe and Adam leave Trek, they fly directly to Madrid, Spain, to meet with one of the greatest minds in the sport. Hey, guys. Hi. Hey, Johan. Hey, how are you? Joe Prano, nice to meet Johan. you. Nice to meet you. Johan. How are you? I'm Adam. Awesome. Nice to meet you, Adam. It's nice to meet you. Johan you. Bruniel is one of the most prominent names in cycling. His legendary status came during his current tenure as Discovery's director sportif, cycling's equivalent to a head coach. All seven of Lance Armstrong's Tour de France victories came in the slipstream of Bruniel's masterful direction. Now the gifted cycling strategist will share his wisdom with Adam and Joe. The closer we got to actually meeting Johan, I was definitely building up a lot of nerves. Uh, I kind of wanted to, you know, let him know that I knew a lot about cycling, at the same time show the respect that I know he's, you know, the god of, of cycling right now. And once we sat down and talked, we really got a flow going. So, five weeks, six weeks? Just about, yeah. Yeah, you guys have to be in France and, and ready to go. So tell me a little bit what yeah, kind I mean, of training have you been doing? As far as training, I just got to 
At this point, when, you know, when I found out this, this was going to happen, you know, I started doing like hill repeats and tried to do 30 miles a day. But I know that 30 it, miles a day. Yeah. But in the next month, I'm <laughs> kicking that double that up. Yeah, I know it's yeah. not enough. How about you? I mean, I work during the day, so I generally ride my bike in the morning and I ride my bike home at night. Like on the weekends, I try to you get go, out. You go to your work with yeah. your bike. How far? I, how far? Uh, it's about 12 miles in, about 12 miles home. So a total of about 24 miles or so. You have to increase, knowing that you're going to challenge, I mean, you're some, some serious hills for a 15 to 20 kilometer climb, one and a half hour going uphill nonstop. Yeah. I mean, you look like you're going to be okay, but I think you should definitely work on losing some weight. Yeah. Imagine that you have a backpack of 10 kilos <sighs> and you can get rid of it. Yeah, that's a good. Yeah. That's a good way to think about it. Um, this is the last stage in the Pyrenees, and it's it's definitely the hardest one. You can have a look here. So this is this is what it looks like. What you guys have to do on the bike. Oh boy. H C. So it's gonna be etched in my brain. Yeah. Do you have the Marie Blanc? It looks like a little one, mm -hmm. right. but it's nine kilometers, eight percent average. And then this one is the called the Obisk. This is 17 kilometers long, and it's 7% average. Wow. Oh my God. Just know it's, it's hard for the professionals, and it's their job. Yeah. I'm happy to be a little part, little part of it. Yeah. Uh, the wow. big part is you guys, and you, you guys have to get up there, but um, yeah. I'm pretty sure you're going to make it. Thanks. That's, that's encouraging. That really is. Listening to Johan describe the Pyrenees may have been an eye-opener for the riders. But hearing about the climbs is one story. Riding them is a very different one. Adam and Joe's training is about to go from zero to 60 as they join one of the top climbers on the circuit, Tom Danielson. Tom's bulletproof reputation was solidified at the 2005 Tour de Georgia, where he took first place overall. Hey, guys. What's up? Hey. How are you Come on inside. Cool. All right. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. For Thanks for having us over. This is my coach, Dave. Hey, nice to meet you, Joe. Got some fresh coffee for you guys. Great. How are you guys feeling? How's the jet lag and everything? Trip was trip was good. Jet lag is still uh, still there a little bit, but I think we're we're feeling pretty good now. It's really good that you guys are being able to do this and, and see different countries and yeah, around different is. places. I'm just having an easy day today, so I'll take you guys on. A nice spin through some of the roads that I train on, and hopefully you enjoy it. Adam and Joe won't only be riding the team bike, but will wear the same kits worn by the Discovery Cycling Team. For their first training session in the mountains, Adam and Joe are joined by not one, but two professional riders. Tom's wife, Kristen, is a fellow cyclist and joins them on the climb. Dust. And the pavement is quite bad here, too. Yeah. It's slower, you know? Right. Earlier in the race, like when the attacks are going or the pace is really high, we go through a lot of small towns. You know, this would be typical. We'd come flying down here and then a hard left and then the whole peloton would blow all apart and then everyone has to chase and come back together and it's just kind of... A race within the race, you know? As the riders climb, the increasing altitude greatly reduces the number of oxygen molecules they can take in per breath. They will feel the effects in their respiratory systems as well as in their muscles, which will tire without proper oxygen levels. If you're not used to training at altitude, it's quite a shock uh, to your body. When I'm climbing at home, I'm short of breath, and stick me in an area with less oxygen, it's going to be even that much harder. How you feeling, Adam? Uh, out of breath. I just don't feel like I can breathe. Yeah, like, yeah, I'm just I'm gonna check the altitude now, see where we're at. Yeah, I mean, we're at 3,500 feet, so. Yeah. It's weird, it's like you take a breath and you think that you get, get what you normally do, but it's like no, half No, you can tell, it. like, <laughs> the, the moment you breathe in, that it's like, it's different, you yeah. know? There's some sick climbs up here. Now we're in France. Oh, wow. This is uh, a lot tougher than I thought. I mean, it's really hard to breathe. It's kind of hard to talk, too. 
You guys are getting some good before shots. I'm going to be much better at this in about six weeks. How's it going? It's going up. <laughs> You're doing awesome. Thanks. It's not easy. Sometimes, too, it's good, like, to change, like, when it gets steep, you know, get out of the saddle. OK. And then uh, kind of alternate in the saddle, out of the saddle. Adam's struggle on his first major climb exposed an area he needs to significantly improve on. Good job. Thanks. Thanks for the tips down there. Physical conditioning could pose a serious threat to his overall success during the Stage 16 ride. It's funny, Johan was like, I was talking to him about training, and uh, he's like, yeah, he's like climbing. He's like, just imagine yourself with a backpack with about 15 pounds in it right now. And yeah. Imagine yourself training with it. And he's like, imagine just dropping that backpack and how much better you'll feel. It's yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah, all of us, it's always a constant struggle with the, you know, we try to have as, the most amount of power as you can with the least amount of weight. Right. Yeah. For me, the best thing has been to train a lot and eat a lot. Uh, if you guys want to ride more, you guys can ride more. That's no problem with me. For me, I mean, this would be like a pretty good day for me. Like, I, I think about this point, I'd be about ready to start rolling back. I don't want to get too far away from home usually. Maybe I'll take you guys a, back, a different way back home. Like I said, today's just a super easy day for, for me, so yeah. It's a lot harder when you can't breathe. <laughs> guys it was great riding with you yeah awesome job thanks yeah. you guys are really impressive coming over here it's been great spending the time with you guys and i'll take that motivation to the dauphine and hopefully represent the east coast there. yeah nice yeah. that'd be good yeah. awesome yeah thanks for for taking us out really, yeah no problem really enjoyed it out here yeah it was great with the pain of today's climb writhing through their legs Joe and Adam make the trip from Alp to Girona to meet and train with the two Discovery Team riders, George Hincappy and Levi Liepheimer. So how did you get to Girona? <laughs> <laughs> there was this uh, big ad that said, do you have what it takes to ride stages of the tour? I was like, yeah, I can do that. No, I, I didn't say that. So but you'll go back to the US before? Yeah. Yeah, we'll go back and train on our own, I guess, and, you know, find as many hills as we yeah. can, try to simulate altitude, I don't know. Well, it's it's kind of high, but it's it's not the highest of altitude. You know, like, in, in, the, in the mountains in Europe, aren't, it's not like Colorado, but even going to, you know, three, 4,000 feet, you can feel it. You, you, you breathe harder, and you can't, uh, you can't go as fast, but it's like that for everybody, so. Yeah. Well, one of my, my training focuses is on dropping weight and, like, getting, because climbing mountains isn't easy, you know? This is probably not the best for dropping weight, but <laughs> cheers. <laughs> hey, that's all right. <laughs> Their day started over a cup of coffee with one of today's most bright and promising young riders. It ends over a glass of wine with two of the more accomplished riders on the circuit. Somewhere in between, these two amateur riders packed in a 60-mile ride through one of the most challenging mountain ranges anywhere. Tonight, they will rest. Tomorrow, they will start to understand what it takes to train for the Tour de France when they do it all over again. With less than a day to recover, they're back on their bikes to join two of Discovery's top riders. For George Hincappy and Levi Liepheimer, today's training ride is considered a short one. In less than 24 hours, both cyclists will race the Criterium de Dauphiné Libre. But for Joe and Adam, keeping pace with the Discovery riders will be a challenge. The effects of yesterday's climb have now set in, leaving them sore and exhausted. Are you guys ready? Yeah. yeah. Let's do it. Let's go. Our ride with George and Levi today was absolutely amazing. It was completely picturesque. We had everything from farmhouses to rolling hills to bales of hay. You know, I can see why these guys live here. Girona is just an amazing place. Getting a chance to be in Girona 
and, and having the opportunity to experience all this in my bike is, is an unforgettable experience. Just trying to refuel because I can feel that my body's drained. My legs were so worked from the Pyrenees that I fell behind just a few times with George and Levi. Pretty good. Yeah. My, a little nice. drain from yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, the Pyrenees took it out of you. Yeah. It's a little easier to breathe down here. Yeah, though. a little more oxygen. Nice. Uh, that was fun. Good road. Until right. so we got to some of the hills, it's kind of where I started to feel my legs a little bit from yesterday. And my uh, my back a little bit. Like, Trying to raise your saddle a little bit. It's kind of low. I actually I did a little bit last uh, night, but I, I think I might bring it up a little bit more. Yeah. Nice work, guys. Yeah, yeah, great work. Thanks. All right. Thanks for the ride. Next step, Tour de France, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was good stuff. Yeah. I was kicking my ass. It's awesome. It's hot today. You guys cool to look. In two days, Joe and Adam logged over 120 miles on their bikes training on some of the most challenging roads Spain has to offer. And yet, both riders know that these punishing terrains don't compare to the mountains they will face next month when they head to France. In two days, Joe and Adam logged over 120 miles on their bikes training on some of the most challenging roads Spain has to offer. Now they take their bikes back to the States for a crash course in altitude training. Chris Carmichael is the personal coach for Lance Armstrong and played an instrumental role in his seven tour victories. A former cyclist and accomplished author, he also founded Carmichael Training Systems in 1999. After experiencing the effects of mountain climbing firsthand in Spain, Adam and Joe turned to Chris Carmichael and his staff to help prepare for their Tour de France climb. Well, listen, guys, um, we got a full day in store for you. We got, we're going to do a uh, three-dimensional bike fit, and then we're going to do a VO2 test on both you guys. Let's go on back to our lab, okay? All right. Great. All right, good. Proper fit on a bicycle is absolutely critical. We're going to start to harness you up here. We're going to be placing an optical tracking harness on key points of your body. Yeah, I feel like I'm making a video game. These sensors record the rider's movements and send a digital image back to the computer for the trainers to analyze. There's basically um, three things that we consider comfort, aerodynamics, and biomechanics. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a balance between those three. As we go more towards comfort, then we, then we sacrifice some aerodynamics and also uh, some biomechanical uh, efficiency as well. So we're just gonna ask you to ride at a comfort level. We're gonna be capturing this information using this camera, going right back to our computer, and then we're gonna be able to analyze it and look at where we can make some adjustments. Down here you can see these are some of your angles that you've got. Fantastic. First thing we, I like to do is focus on making sure we've got the correct saddle height. When we look at the knee extension angle, that range where an athlete needs to be is about 25 to about 35 degrees. Right. And it looks like he's up about 38. Well, Joe, when he came here, there were some adjustments we made in regards to the fit on, on his bike. And the big adjustment was his leg extension. Up on it. Really towards the bottom of the pedal stroke is when you have, when you're producing the greatest power. So we got him in an acceptable range, small adjustment to his four and a half, but by and large, he really was actually sitting fairly good. I think we probably uh, got a little more power out of him. Congratulations. Thanks. All right. With Adam, um, he had a little bit of a swing at the bottom of his pedal stroke with his knee. What, what happens is there's a large amount of uh, loss of energy. So we raised his saddle, so he's got a little more leg extension. With that, we also got a little more extension, uh, arm extension as well, so that opens up his chest. Also means he can use his lower back and his hip muscles uh, a little better. Now we've got you fit right on your bike. We're gonna go in and to our little shop of horrors over sure. here, our, <laughs> our uh, human performance lab. 
From this information that we're going to collect, we'll be able to put together a training program to get you ready for the cold day abyss. As Adam rides, this test will measure the amount of oxygen that his muscles use to produce energy at extreme workout levels. It's basically you versus the bike, you go until you can't go anymore. And it'll progressively get harder as well. The body's muscles rely on the oxygen consumed during periods of exertion. The more oxygen the body consumes, the more energy the muscles can produce during intense exercising. VO2 still going up, you got a lot left. Come on, dig deep. Looks like it's going to be a pretty tough test, and uh, I guess I get, you know, I get to know what's coming, you know? But it uh, doesn't look like it's going to be easy, that's for sure. With training, they will be able to raise the maximum amount of oxygen they can consume, otherwise known as their VO2 max. This will play a key role in the Pyrenees, where high altitudes limit the amount of oxygen they take in per breath. The high altitudes of Colorado Springs serves as a precursor to the excruciating conditions Adam and Joe will face in the Pyrenees. Tonight, they will fly to their homes. With their Tour de France challenge just a month away, they must spend that time training every chance they can. The next time they see each other will be in France, setting out to tackle stage 16, the Col de Bisque. By the time Joe and Adam arrive in France, the tour is well underway. All right, here's where the circus starts. <laughs> Tomorrow, they will preview stage 16, finally seeing their challenge face to face. But today is a day for relaxing. This is huge. As part of the Live in the Dream package, Joe and Adam get to go behind the ropes with the Discovery Team. Their warm-ups, man, are like, uh, yeah, yeah. Their all-access passes allow them to start where most spectators must stop. Hey, George. Right. How you doing? Good, man. Good luck today. Yeah. 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 So you got the hand lines going. Yeah, sure. I've been on the bike a lot. <laughs> cool. All right. Yeah. All right, good luck. Good luck bro. today, yeah. Hey, good luck. Hey, how are you, man? Good, how are you? Hey, good luck today. Uh -huh. Coming right up on the start, man. It's right yeah, up here. Right there. This is ridiculous how close. Yeah, yeah I mean, they're weighing all the bikes right here. Yeah, here comes George. Yeah, man, I can't believe we were just having dinner with him and then ride with him. I know. It's hard to believe that now we're watching him do his last time. Let's go, George. As the race day winds down, Joe and Adam must put the excitement of the event behind them and focus on the real reason for their trip. The day before their climb, they will set out to preview stage 16 and see the challenge that awaits them. My name's uh, Kirkby and I'm a Trek travel guide and I'm gonna be providing support for Joe and Adam. Trek Travel is a travel company that is based around Trek bicycles. We cater for everything from people that want to ride one mile to 100 miles. And uh, our trips are also divided into ones that go through the mountains, like what we're going to be doing here, and ones that are more casual. Tomorrow's going to be a big day. It's uh, when you guys are going to be riding stage 16 of the Tour de France. Today, the idea is to get you guys familiar, one, with the course, and two, the big climbs you're going to go over. Just to get to see the climbs before actually doing it, um, you know, you kind of felt like it felt like a pro rider with, you know, with your your team manager in the car, getting ready for the stage for the Tour de France. Previewing our first climb at San Martin, we're really, I was going back and forth between being, I can't believe I'm riding my bike here, and I was really battling some motion sickness. I mean, those tight turns going up that mountain, I was thinking, how am I going to do this on a bike? In the Pyrenees, you have the issue with uh, animals, so you have lots of sheep and cows all over the course, and there's nothing that's going to stop them from coming on the course. Uh, it's getting a little bit scary now, but... Yeah. It's pretty intimidating when you look at the, the course on paper, but coming out here and getting a chance to see it, I mean, really uh, puts it all into perspective. I mean, it's so massive. It's going to be a tough day. All righty, guys, we're at the top of the Col d'Obisque. 
biggest elevation gain, and it's the one that's just gonna keep going and going and going. Eight, nine, ten percent. And the following day, the riders come here. This is the finish. It's gonna be an awesome day. Yeah, I'm pretty psyched. I can't wait to get here tomorrow. I'm pretty psyched about it, so it's gonna be an epic climb. Yeah, it is. You guys can have a good dinner, get some energy, get the rest, and then tomorrow morning we head out and we do stage 16. That's awesome. Good, man. Right on. The past two months have been a road that leads to just one destination. Tonight, Joe and Adam retire to their rooms, each passing minute bringing them that much closer to the defining moment of this journey. Come daybreak, they will mount their bikes and set off to climb two Category 1 mountains and then finish with the Or Category Col de Abyss. The night before the actual riding of the stage, I was pretty nervous, you know. I'd close my eyes and kind of just see the undulating profile, you know, the big climbs, big dips, and I was very anxious and, and didn't sleep very well. It was really hard uh, to get some good sleep the night before riding the stage, and my nerves were all over the place. It was like the culmination of everything that I had been training for, so uh, it, was, it was a tough night and really hard to get prepared for. Uh. Over the past six weeks, Joe and Adam have done everything they could to prepare for today's ride. Adam's focus on weight loss yielded significant results. He lost 22 pounds and is at his peak physical condition. Taking Johan's advice, Joe ramped up his training rides. By the end of six weeks, he was logging over 40 miles a day on his bike. Will it be enough to get them up the mountains? It's time to find out. Just getting ready for uh, you know, best ride of my life. Try to warm the body up and get ready for these three massive climbs. So they're going to be pretty intense. Yeah, I feel completely prepared. I mean, I did just about everything I could over the last six or seven weeks to get myself ready. So I'm just really anxious to get out there and see what I can do. It's going to be sick. Hey, clipped in on the first go. That's a good sign. It was good to get you know, kind of like a rolling start, um, not climbing right away. So it was good to you know kind of roll through the, the roads of Spain and kind of warm our legs up and uh, really give us a chance to reflect on what we were going to be doing for the next seven hours. The road leading up to San Martin, you could kind of see a majority of the, the mountain that you're climbing. Um, and just looking at it and starting it, you know that this is just the start of three major climbs you're going to be doing. Who doesn't like swerves? Look at the cast. Just unreal, really. Yeah. Nice work, buddy. Here's the top. Getting up there and then turning around and looking off the side and seeing how far you've come up the mountain is just incredible. I don't think oftentimes watching the tour you get an idea of the magnitude of how big and how large these climbs are. I can't tell if it's altitude or if I'm just out of breath, you know? Um, but, uh, it's, uh, I think the toughest thing has been the wind. Yeah, it definitely affected us. Our, our speed just dropped. After completing more than 20 miles of their first Category 1 climb, Adam and Joe will descend and approach an even tougher task. Next up, the Col de la Marie Blanc, which is the one that really digs steep right at the end, gets up to 13%. Come over that, we're going into La Runde, and then it's Col de Bis to the finish. Awesome. You guys psyched? Right yeah. on. You guys are doing the stage 16. Ready to go. They wish you the best. The 
The descent off of San Martin really stressed me out quite a bit. It was, it was some pretty heavy fog. The road was, was really slick. The turns were really tight, and I've never done a descent of that length I and mean, that's in that, that steep. Uh, when I got to the top of San Martin and, and saw the descent below me, I knew it was just I was just going to try to fly down it like the pros do. You know, I had been watching the pros in the Alps kind of taking the hairpin turns, and I couldn't wait to try, you know, my own skill, my own style, kind of flying down the mountain. It was it was a lot of fun descending. When we reach the turn off to the Mari Blanc, there she is. you see the sign and you look off to the right and it just starts to shoot straight up and your mind immediately starts racing and, and going through all the things that we saw the day prior. It's uh, scary. <laughs> Mari Blanc is, is definitely a tricky climb. Uh, when you look at the profile, it looks like it's, you know, not that steep at the bottom, um, but it really ramps up towards the top and gets very steep. Water. It's, it's a shorter climb than the other two, but uh, towards the top, it's just so steep. It's just unbelievable. Definitely cooked. I mean, it's taken just about everything I got just to uh, stay on the bike. Do you like, think it's just? I can't even hold a straight line, and then it's so steep. I can't even bend down to get water. Um, how many k off to the summit? They say you've got 2K to the top. Yeah, I mean, I think I can. Go ahead and get clipped down. I'll hold you up. I got you. I got it. Thanks. All right. Top of Marie Blanc, um, probably one of the hardest climbs I've ever done. Uh, it was very steep towards the top. Um, it was definitely a very hard climb, and now we have the obelisk still. So I'm tr gonna try to conserve some energy going down the hill and uh, eat a little bit and, and regroup and, and really hit the obelisk hard. I was going to make those last couple of K. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what was underneath my feet, but... Yeah, I just glad I made it. I was just... I was a mess because I was disappointed. I really wanted to make it to the top, but physically, I was just cooked. I was done. With Adam abandoning after the second climb, Joe will set out alone to tackle the last mountain, Col de Abisque. I have to cheer you from the car, man. I'm cooked. All right. Yeah, uh, Marie uh, that was, Blanc got me. That was tough, man. <laughs> that was definitely one of the toughest climbs I've ever been up. Yeah. And now I have this. Good luck. Thanks. The professional winner of stage 16 finished the stage in six hours and 23 minutes. If Joe can continue this pace, he will finish just a half hour behind the fast pro time, an impressive feat for an amateur rider. The first 2K of the, the Col de Abyss, Joe was absolutely just flooring it. And I'm thinking to myself, hey, is he gonna be able to hold this pace to the top? And I was just cheering him on. I mean, it was fun to watch.
time, man. Oh, yeah. Dude, crap out, man. Awesome. You made it to the finish of stage 16, Tour de France. I'm dead, man. That was awesome, buddy. Oh, thanks. Man. How you feeling? Good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty, that was, uh, pretty that was the dream, last uh, climb. It was tough. It was tough. I was actually cramping up towards yeah. the top, so I mean, I had so much adrenaline, it just kind of carried me up to the top. So. Yeah, right on. Oh man, what a tough climb. Yeah. Just gotta refuel now and, and rest up and cool. Watch the pros do it tomorrow. Joe finished stage 16 in seven hours and 17 minutes, just 54 minutes off the fastest professional time at this year's Tour de France. His final time was comparable to many of the team riders' times. Though Adam Austin abandoned towards the end of the ride, he can still put two of the Pyrenees' toughest climbs on his cycling resume. More than 54 miles of punishing climbing at inclines of up to 7.5%, an achievement very few amateur riders can claim. Exhausted from their climb, elated from their accomplishments, the riders will now watch the professionals labor up those same mountains in stage 16 of the Tour de France. La Pierre Saint Martin, they're starting to climb it. I remember exactly how I felt like at that at that point. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. See, about halfway up, the wind started just killing us. I mean, yeah. hammering us. You know, started off flat, um, and then you kind of just look to the left, and it was just like a a cliff at first. It looks so much different on TV though. Like, you know, it doesn't look as steep and I mean, the way the riders go up, it yeah. looks, you know, much easier than it actually was. You know, they're superhuman pretty much. Yeah. Um, the way they climb these mountains, it's just unbelievable. How as they, they reflect on the day's ride, reality sets in. The hardest part of the trip is over, but the excitement is only just beginning. The tradition of the Tour de France has the race end in Paris every year. On the last day of the tour, Joe and Adam take a leisurely ride across the course. This once-in-a-lifetime opportunity is only made better from the results of the Tour de France itself. Just hours before the end of the race, Discovery Channel has locked up the overall team win, and Joe and Adam have front row seats for the finish. Prime real estate here, man. Yeah, no. Levi Liepheimer will share the podium with fellow teammate Alberto Contador. Dude, this has been amazing. This is the icing on the cake. Definitely. I mean, standing here at the finish and sipping champagne now. Can't beat it, really. No. Experience of a lifetime. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers. The past two months have been filled with gifts, icons, travel, and celebration. It tastes like yellow. <laughs> yeah, it does. For any cyclist, the opportunity to cap off the ride of a lifetime by celebrating a tour victory with the winners would be a fantasy beyond their wildest imagination. For Joe and Adam, it is a storybook ending to a dream made into a reality. This has just been a great experience all around. I got to live out my dream on the Pyrenees. I got inside the ropes at the TT, and now I'm here on the Champs-Élysées having the champagne with the podium buyers. This doesn't get any better than this. Thanks, Discovery.